Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. David here and I am joined by a special guest and that is Nikki from Shaping Behaviour. Now I've had Avian Vets on the channel, I have had Sophie on the channel, I have had random people on the channel, I have had Jason on the channel, nutritionist, but I don't remember actually talking to another animal trainer, especially not a UK based one. So I'm very excited to welcome Nikki onto the channel and tell us a little bit about yourself, Nikki, so people can get to know you. Hi, David. Thanks for inviting me to be on the channel with you. This is uh, quite exciting for me. Um, my name is Nikki Plaskett and um, I run a business called Shaping Behaviour, which is a zoological behaviour consultancy. Um, so I've spent 20 years plus, just over 20 years, uh, working in zoos and aquariums, worked with so many different species um, I've been really lucky in my career I've managed to work with some amazing people some amazing animal trainers and of course such a huge collection of animals that I've learned something from with every different individual that I've worked with um, uh, most recently I was at Paradise Wildlife Park um, here in Hertfordshire and I was there for nine years running the bird team um, which basically meant that we did free flight bird shows we also managed aviary birds and a group of penguins um, not to fly um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know a few other sort of interesting species on that team um, but we I also created uh, the the role of animal training coordinator for myself sort of carved out a position across the zoo which basically meant that I got to put my training skills into practice with all of the other teams and help everybody to make sure that we were all training our animals in the same uh, with the same methods and you know with the same best practice up-to-date guidelines um, and I did that for several years and then in 2021 I left Paradise to set up on my own and now here we are a couple of years in and I have the best job in the world really because I get to work with lots of different people lots of different animals at lots of different collections um, both zoos and colleges um, I have a few private clients as well but Basically, if you're working with a species and you're trying to manage a behavior or teach new behaviors or you've hit a wall with, you know, your training and you've got got to a point and you can't figure out how to get any further, then basically that's what I do. I come in and help people to solve the issues and uh, teach new skills to their new staff and try and get everybody on the same page. And we're using the, the most positive methods of um behavior change that are available to us uh using science basically <laughs> oh, that's really awesome i mean we actually me and sophie did a course with nikki which is part of the reason i thought i'd ask nikki onto the channel and also we, we see how positive your the impact you make is via instagram so we both follow your instagram it's really exciting to see the stuff you do um it's just yeah it's, it's an absolute pleasure having you on a channel which is what you just talked about kind of leads on to our first sort of topic really and it's something that i talk about a lot on the channel it's a lot a lot of trainers will talk about it a lot of good trainers will talk about it and that is positive reinforcement and consent-based training you know i wanted to sort of talk to you about it and why it's so important that's my first sort of question so obviously you guys who watch my channel will have heard me preach about that but i wanted you to hear someone else's opinion on why positive reinforcement and consent-based training is so important and that's also not to say that positive necessarily means positive in um like amazing good thing it just means a plus thing in this context so nikki what was your opinion on that and why do you think it's so important okay well i mean positive reinforcement based training is that's the camp that i sit in like all the time that's everything that i'm going to be doing when i'm working with a new team or with their animals it's all reliant on this scientific procedure of positive reinforcement so behavior change is a science right and because it's a science that means it's been tested and it's been proven uh, the laws of behavior change have been trialed um, across pretty much every species that you could think of um, and positive reinforcement that is the addition of a desirable stimulus after a behavior has occurred which results in that behavior happening again in the future right that's that's the scientific definition of positive reinforcement training Sci uh, positive reinforcement training doesn't have any scientifically documented side effects okay so <laughs> you know, there, are, there are side effects when you're using negative reinforcement and you're using positive punishment or negative punishment strategies we're not going to go into those because that's not what we're using for our training but there aren't any side effects with positive reinforcement in its simplest terms animals use their behavior to move towards things that they want or move away from things that they don't want. I always want to be something that my animals want to be near, okay? You know, I want my animals to see me coming and think, yes, 
here comes that lady who's bringing me all of these snacks or who lets me do these cool things or that I get to interact with. Okay. I never want to approach an animal and have them go, Oh no, not her. Okay. <laughs> so that's so because of that, you know, and that that's that is in its simplest form. Animals are using their behavior to acquire things that they want or avoid things they don't want. I want to be the thing that they want. Okay. They they want to be near me. Good things happen when I'm around. Um and basically that's why I will always use positive reinforcement. Consent based training is so important. You've touched on it there, you know, and that basically is about respect. It's about giving our animals a voice. Now, we never know what our animals are thinking. Only the animal knows that. But if we get really good at observing their body language, we can understand what they're trying to tell us. And if we react to their body language, as soon as they show us they're uncomfortable in a situation and we back up and go, oh, OK, I'm not quite sure why you don't like that, but you don't like it. Let me change what I'm doing here. We show them that their behavior works. We give them the the respect, the um, the chance to say no, thank you. And we listen to that. And that builds our relationship with them. Our relationships have to be built on trust there. But that's that's how we get anywhere in life, isn't it? You know, we have to trust each other, our co-workers, our family members, our peers, our managers, whoever it is that we're working with. Um, but our animals as well. We have to trust them and they have to trust us. And it's so important. And all of that comes from this science based positive reinforcement training that that myself and obviously David and Sophie talk about all the time on their channel. Yeah, it's so it's so important to have that trust and to have your animal feel that they can be themselves around you mm -hmm. and that when they tell you something you will respect that you know a lot of the times when we're looking at bonding especially initial bonding like when a person gets a, a parrot well obviously it's gonna be a parrot on this channel a parrot into their home and they're immediately saying well why isn't the parrot loving me why isn't the parrot behaving sorry it's a fly there why isn't the parrot um, behaving in a certain way and it's like well it's just it's just met you there's no trust there's no bond it's like moving country for them they don't know what's happened you know they're in a new environment and you have to build that trust and you can do that via positive reinforcement, linking yourself with that positive things, being the bringer of lovely treats and finding out what those treats are as well. Because you can't just bring them random things and expect them to be like, wow, this is amazing. You can't use yourself as a positive reinforcer initially as well, especially they don't know that you're good. You have to create that that link basically in their mind. And that's where it often comes so becomes so important. The consent based training is all what we're all about, really. Something I wanted to touch on as well with negative reinforcement and trust building. So obviously you said that positive reinforcement doesn't have any sort of side effects. When we're talking about negative reinforcement, sometimes me and Sophie recommend using it when you first have a parrot in the home. For example, if you have a parrot that's very nervous of you, they're in the cage and you can't really use positive reinforcement yet because you, you, know, you have to obviously have to deliver it through your hand or you're basically just dropping it into the bowl and then moving away. You can use yourself as a negative reinforcer. So if they're scared of you, you move to the point where they're a little bit nervous, you stop. And then you wait for the calm, then you take yourself away. Is that something that you'd you'd agree with or would you recommend like really pushing with the positive side of it and adding in those those great things into the environment or maybe using a combination? So negative reinforcement. Uh, OK, so in, in the real world, the, the quadrants, if you if anybody's familiar with the, the four quadrants of operant conditioning, you've got your positive and negative reinforcement, positive and negative punishment, um, you know, reinforcement behavior increases. OK, that's that's what that's what the web means. OK, so whether yeah. it's being reinforced through through desirable uh, consequences or by uh, so negative reinforcement is often called escape avoidance learning because the animal is moving away from an undesirable stimulus in order to increase the future frequency of behavior. The problem for me with that is that the aversive stimulus has to be added in in the first place and sometimes aversive stimuli are environmental and sometimes they're you know it rains and therefore the bird flies into its indoor house okay so its behavior of going inside has been negatively reinforced because it's avoiding the rain we didn't make it rain okay so so you know that's that's a, an environmental negative reinforcer in play the behavior of staying outside at the same time would be positively punished by the addition of the rain which is undesirable assuming it's not a parrot that wants to have a bath in the rain at this point so <laughs> <laughs> so for me when we're using um negative reinforcement to train animals that we're working with I can see what you're saying, which is as in you are technically the aversive stimulus at the moment because your bird doesn't know you. And so you're going to remove yourself. For me, I would remove myself 
sooner. So I would I, would I rather than approaching seeing levels of discomfort, waiting for a, a calm behavior and then removing myself, I would try to work that differently. So I would try with things, I would be using positive reinforcement, but I'd be using it slightly differently. So instead of just um, trying to get to a point where I can offer my food, uh, my bird food, I would, like you said, drop food into a bowl, but I would position the bowl so that I could approach from an, a direction that the bird could see me coming, and I'm, here we go, there's a seed, it's going right into your bowl and I keep walking. So I'm not asking for anything from that bird. I don't need the bird to come towards me. I don't need it to come and take the food while I'm there. Absolutely nothing at all. All I'm doing is every single time I walk past that cage that the bird is in or the room the bird is in, the aviary, however your, your setup is, as soon, every time I walk past, here's something good and I just keep going. Very quickly, you start to notice that your bird goes, oh, is that person's coming again? Maybe are they bringing something good? And when they start looking and thinking, potentially thinking, I don't know what they're thinking, but when they start looking at you, like they're looking forward to your approach, that's when you can start upping that criteria slightly where you say, oh, do you know what? I'm gonna put a seed in. You've started approaching the bowl while I'm still here. So I'm gonna put another seed in and then I'm still gonna move away again because we're still building that relationship. We're still allowing that bird to be comfortable in our presence. But when we, when we position ourselves near any animal um, and their body language tells us that they're uncomfortable, my first instinct is to back up immediately because that way I'm showing them that I've noticed that they're uncomfortable and I'm going to back away before they escalate it. I understand what you're saying because if you're uh, standing still and you're not threatening, then your bird might start to relax and therefore then you can approach further or on the next time you can approach further. But I always like to think about it in terms of a scary clown, okay? <laughs> I don't like clowns, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, when I'm trying to explain this to uh, different groups of people, sometimes I say, well, I don't know how my animal's feeling, but if I imagine how I feel, if A scary clown comes and stands in the doorway to the room that I'm in and I can't get out of the room because the clown's in the doorway so there's nothing that I can do and I sit there or stand there whatever it is and my heart starts racing and I might start breathing rapidly and thinking oh, what's gonna happen is it gonna come in the room and maybe the clown doesn't come in the room it just stands there and looks at me and so after a few minutes I go okay, okay maybe it's not so scary is it is it okay and then the clown leaves okay but for that first two seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, five minutes, however long it takes, I am in a, an undesirable emotional state. I, again, I don't know how your animals are feeling, but I always do liken it to myself. I put myself in a situation where somebody would be using that technique with me and I don't feel comfortable then applying that same technique because of the way that I think I would feel about it. So my advice would be to use positive reinforcement wherever you possibly can. And, you know, yes, maybe if you've been using the dropping food in the bowl for two weeks and your bird is still absolutely not wanting to get any closer to you at all, then maybe there's a conversation about a different technique. But initially, that's where I would always start. Mm -hmm. it's, it's always good to start with positive. And also, it's one of the reasons I asked you on this channel to hear another trainer's perspective, because me and Sophie aren't arrogant enough to think that everything we do is going to be perfect and everything we advise is going to be right. So I like to hear from other people. I like to feel like we can have, everyone can have a cooperative relationship to improve uh, animal training rather than a competitive one. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons I approached you because I feel like that's your attitude basically in general, which is really helpful. Um, I had a couple of thoughts on this topic as well mm -hmm. with regards to it. Um, and they're disappearing readily because my, my jumping spy is distracting me by crawling right next to me. So, um, yes, basically, I think positive positive reinforcement should be the first like step in every single one. And I like the way you've got sort of when you're talking through that example, it's like an escalation of the tree. So you're walking past drop one, then you notice the um, the positive association, you drop two. So that builds on that. And that's very interesting to hear because that's a, a nice way of approaching it to keep on escalating that trust and that positive association. The other thing I was going to say is, with regards to um, viewing, putting ourselves in the perspective, I find it very useful as well. Um, anthropomorphism sometimes can be very um, harmful when you're thinking about training, but sometimes it can be very useful to say, well, 
my my animal is my bird is scared how would i feel in that situation if a giant was approaching me with a giant hand or whatever you know in other contexts you have to be careful how you do it and that's something that i always try to keep in the back of my mind with a lot of people like for example um it's not really on the topic today, but I'll just brief, briefly mention it as an example of like hormonal behavior. A lot of people mistake that in their parrots as affection, when in reality, you're just encouraging your, you're actually frustrating your parrot, encouraging your parrot to uh, behave in a certain way. So do use putting yourself in a perspective, but use it responsibly as well, because um, it's very easy to sort of slip up on it. Yeah, absolutely. And like you just said there as well, David, like there, I know that there are people out there who are using negative reinforcement with a variety of animals and they're getting great results from it. So this is this is my opinion and this is based on what I know and what I've done. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, like like yourselves, I'm not saying, well, this is the only way and this is definitely the way that everybody should do things because reinforcement is reinforcement the behavior increases either way and like you just said I am anthropomorphizing there by putting myself in the animal's position but that is a way that I have found to be really effective getting a message across when I'm teaching and when I'm working with an animal I really pride myself on trying to observe the most subtle signs of discomfort in my animal like observation of body language is so very important and you know I don't know what that animal is thinking I will never know what that animal is thinking but if I start to see all oh, feathers are twitching we're starting to you know we're slicking our feathers back down or fluffing them up because parrots are enigmas and one <laughs> parrot fluffs his feathers up to mean one thing and the other one slicks them back down again um but you know as soon as I see any subtle changes like that um if I've got the opportunity to observe that bird when I'm not interacting with it I will start looking at what those uh, subtle body language changes might mean in the environment when it's nothing to do with me and if I notice that the bird fluffs his feathers up and then actively moves away from something that gives me information that perhaps when this bird is uncomfortable it will start to fluff its feathers up okay so yeah it's something that if you've got enough time to sit and spend observing your birds which you know is great is a luxury really but um sometimes you know if you've got your bird out in the evening and the, sitting on a perch in the side of the the lounge then instead of just watching the tv look at your bird see what your bird's doing spend time sort of interacting with it in that way you, you know without actually physically doing anything just watching and learning from your bird and learning because everybody's an individual as well that's the thing right we're all individuals our animals our birds are all completely individual even if you've got the same species they might behave completely differently to certain stimuli 100 percent. we we always say the same every every parrot's individual they're so advanced as um speed as, as creatures as well so they are going to show more signs of individuality but that's reminded me of the other thing as well that i wanted to mention which was observing you know observing the body language watching like you just said literally it may be like you have five minutes just watch what your bird's doing watch what they uh how they interact when a bird flies by the window or when there's a loud sound on the television that will give you a lot of indication as to how they're behaving i spend a lot of time watching my cockatiels and conyers just to get an idea of how they behave i mean our crimson belly conyers my goodness are they um uh unpredictable would be the would be the word for them i mean i've dealt with green cheeks for a very long time but crimson bellies are a whole new board game ball game sorry and it's through observation that I've actually made a lot of progress with them. You know, going from one rescue came into the house destroying me, like literally tearing chunks out of my flesh, to wanting to play with me, yet making this this um human yell whenever he sees me. But it's actually excitement, and happiness, you know, not even overstimulation. And it just took observation and patience and also positive reinforcement and training. So yeah, it is just do observe your birds, do take the time to observe your birds. And you know, I've got videos on conyers and cockatiels, which you can watch, which will give you a head start. Your bird may be slightly different in their vocalizations, but you know, there's lots of stuff you can do to improve your relationship with your bird. Can so I, sorry to interrupt you there. I just wanted to add on to your observation skills there, because what I would really urge people to do, anyone who's watching this channel, if you've got that opportunity to sit and observe your birds, try to get really good at describing the behaviour that you see. Because as humans, we love to put labels on things. You know, we absolutely love to say, ah, oh, well, that is excitement. Ah, oh, that's fear. That's play, you know, whatever it is. But instead of putting the label on it, try to get really good at actually describing what you're seeing. So um, take aggression, for example. You know, people will say, oh, this bird's aggressive. And aggression, first of all, it looks different for every single individual but it sounds different to each person. So if somebody tells me that their bird is aggressive, my first question is, what does that look like? 
like you know what does that mean to you because it might mean they pin their eyes it might mean they lunge it might mean they fluff their feathers up or slip them back down it might mean that they actually bite you every single person has got a different definition of what aggression looks like whereas if somebody instead says to me Oh, well, I was watching my bird and when I opened the door to open uh, to go into the cage, I put my hand in and as I put my hand in, the bird leaned forward and lunged towards my hand. So then I took my hand away. Now I've got a whole picture. Now I've got all of the information and now we can start looking at, you know, how we can change the function of that behavior or rather change the behavior that needs to happen in order to meet that function. Because potentially the bird is lunging towards your hand to make the hand go away and it worked because you don't want to get bitten because nobody wants to get bitten by their parrot um but if the bird wants the hand to leave then we can respect the bird's body language we can change the way that we approach we can change the way that we open the door we can change the way that we put our hand in if we put our hand in maybe we ask our bird to come out instead and if that bird leans towards us or leans away from us, we can remove our hand then rather than having to have that bird escalate and go towards lunging. So, sorry, I th I'm jumping ahead slightly because I think we are going to talk about yeah, that's <laughs> next in a minute. But I just it was really about the, you know, describing the behavior that you're seeing and get really good at talking in terms of, oh, when I do this, the bird does this and like actually describing what you see rather than just, well, then he's aggressive because you get so much more information. If you are working with consultants like David and Sophie, then you know it really helps them to be able to help you and your bird if you're describing exactly what it is that um, the bird is doing. No, you're 100% you're right. And that's a really valid observation. I think it, that's a really good tip for anyone out there. If you are you know, wanting to sort out a behavior correct one, do observe it and go into a bit more detail about what's happening. Not just as Nikki said, my bird's biting me. Why? You know, why is that happening? What context is it? Because it does help us and it will help you as well. If you have to, if you don't can't afford to get a consultation, if you um are struggling with these behaviors, you need to deal with them on your own. This is a way you can start working towards it. You know, you can look at the observe yourself and see what's happening in the environment. That does lead on to the next neatly to the next topic, which was working through undesirable behaviors. You know, um, me and Sophie have our approaches, which I think are quite similar to yours based on what you just said. You know, working out what the actual cause of the root problem is, trying to um, rectify that and not get to the point where the bird feels they have to do something out of a fear or, you know, because there is an escalation and we may not always notice it. But as you just said, once we start observing, we can see it building and stopping it before that happens, you know, um, using positive reinforcement to form bonds, etc. So you've kind of already sort of mentioned it a little bit. But let's talk a bit, a bit, a bit more detail. What, how would you approach dealing with a problem like biting? Because this is one, this is probably the most common question I get asked. I tried to do a very concise video. It wasn't enough, honestly, because I was just trying to give a quick fire video on it recently. I need to do loads more on it because uh, obviously there's so many different factors that come into a bird bite, a biting or showing aggression. So it's difficult to do very quickly. But how would you handle biting? And I know that's a difficult question based on what I just said. And also, more importantly. How would you handle setbacks to training or when you're dealing with a bird that's nervous around you? For example, you just got a rescue into the house and, you, you know, you really want to do the right thing. You know, you're taking this rescue on. You didn't want to go to a breeder, et cetera. How would you deal with setbacks and um, moving forward past them? OK, so biting, first of all, um, I knew you were going to say about biting because biting <laughs> and screaming, they're the two things that people struggle with with their parrots. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So one thing that I would just really like to say is that just because you have a pet parrot does not mean that you should be being bitten. I can't tell you how many times I hear people say, oh, well, I've got a parrot, so it's fine. I expect to be bitten or it's fine. I, it doesn't hurt. It, it's OK that he bites me because it's not OK that he bites you. Um, for me, I never want my bird to get to the point where it has to bite me to tell me to stop doing something. So because for me, that means that I've missed all of the warning signs, all of the body language that my bird has used to say, I don't like this. I'm not comfortable right now. And I have carried on with whatever it is that I was doing. Now, maybe that's because I'm in a rush 
Maybe it's because the bird has got to go to the vets right then. Maybe it's because the bird will not go back in his cage and it's time for you to go to work. OK, I do understand that there are things going on in people's lives and people who've got pet birds have you know, or you're all saints, to be honest, because I do not want to have a pet parrot. <laughs> They're probably one of the most challenging um, animals that you could have in your home. Um, David's nodding. So. <laughs> That's why I like my isopods because they're they're quiet. They they mind their own business. You know. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. They, you know, I mean, I've worked with parrots for a very, very long time, and they are fantastic birds. They're brilliant fun to work with. Um, but yeah, having one in my own home is something completely different. So I've just been joined by a cat, um, <laughs> she's coming to. Okay, too. Um, hey, Rosie. Um, so yeah, so basically, if your bird is biting you, then I urge you to take a big step back and ask yourself what am I doing that I could do differently? Okay, because you don't want to get bitten, you don't want your bird to have to bite you to communicate with you. So observation comes into this dramatically, because you need to start noticing the signs before your bird bites. So that even if even if you miss all of the other warning signs initially, and you manage to move your hand when the bird lunges before it actually gets you, that means the bird will then learn that lunging means that you back away rather than, sorry, cat tail. Yeah. <laughs> lunging means that you back away rather than biting. With all behavior, with every species, the more we practice it, the better we get at it. Okay, so if your bird is biting you regularly, it's got really good at doing that. And it's probably very good at not bothering with the warning signs because it's learned that they haven't worked in the past and therefore it goes straight to biting. So you need to get really good on your observation skills so that as soon as you see that eye pinning, eye pinning can be such a really useful um a useful sign in parrots that their mood is changing one way or the other maybe they're getting more excitable sorry that's a label um <laughs> maybe it means that they're um thinking that they're uncomfortable but if you notice changes to the pupils if you notice changes to the feathers and if you notice changes to body posture move at that point I would much rather that you move out of your bird's way and it goes, oh, I actually wasn't going to bite you, but okay, thanks. Then that's great because then you can go, oh, good. Okay, let's, shall I try and give you a seed over here and see if we can carry on our training session? Because you've removed the, um, the possibility of that bird practicing the biting behavior. So wherever possible, change the antecedent arrangement, change the setup so that it is not possible for your bird to bite you. If you're still bringing your bird out, make sure that you get really good at reading that bird body language. Um, I'm not saying that we need to stop bringing our birds out and leave them in cages all the time, obviously, but if your bird always bites you when you're trying to put it back into its cage, um, chances are that might be because when it goes back into its cage, the fun is over and you're going out to work and it's just left in its cage and, you know, that's that's the rest of its day. Um, but you know what? It's actually really not that hard to teach them to go back into their cages on their own. And if they go back in on their own to get a nice tasty treat, then they've had control over that situation. They've had a choice to make. Oh, well, I could stay over here on this perch for nothing. Or I could take myself back into this cage and get some nice tasty snacks. Once you've taught that behavior, that just eliminates the need for your bird to be physically picked up and put back into its cage. Therefore, it doesn't get the opportunity to bite you to tell you it doesn't want to go there. So if we can change what we're doing and the way that we're doing it so our birds do not have to try and bite us, that is the ideal situation for everybody. The exception comes when, you know, if we do need to manually restrain them if we're in a vet scenario because sometimes at that point we can't let go of them we can't respect their body language for that short period of time because a vet needs to see something that our birds have got wrong with them but we can teach them voluntary restraint yep. we can <laughs> it's probably for another conversation but you know david and sophie have probably got some materials on this already well, but it's the same with like have... um like voluntary nail trimming and all sorts because it eliminates the need to go down in the first place you know yeah i'm oh, sorry to interrupt there as well like for mm. example um like olive um and chip are the best at this they come up to the bars they get treats and they just present their nails and we can just trim their nails it doesn't have to be done often frankly because they wear them down on the purchase and stuff but if it does need to be done so if you can train things voluntarily and eliminate the need to actually have to restrain in the first place it's much easier sorry sorry to interrupt there 
no it's, that's absolutely like that's perfect and you know I work with some really big zoological collections and they've got hundreds of parrots and they're doing voluntary nail trim behaviors with all of them they also another really valuable behavior is taking medication from a syringe yeah we're doing um, which that I know, well. I know you guys do because <laughs> I've seen videos of it um but you know these are things they're not that difficult to train if we're using positive reinforcement and if we have an understanding of the behavior that we want and how to reinforce that behavior so that it keeps on happening if we do these with our bird in um, a position where they can leave if they want to as well you know put them have them on a perch have them at one end of the perch and have yourself and your syringe at the other end of the perch so that they have to choose to approach you rather than going into their space in the cage with the syringe because at that point chances are they're probably not going to be very comfortable with that unless you happen to have an absolutely enormous aviary and you can stand in and you know without being in your bird's face which most people probably don't have the luxury of having but um you know that's something that definitely voluntary nail trims voluntary syringe um even we can do eye drops we can do nasal swabs there are like honestly there's no limit to the things that we can train using positive reinforcement if we have the creativity to you know to set up the environment to be successful there is there is one thing which i don't love training as a voluntary behavior with birds and that is injections um and uh, there are people out there who are doing it and there are people out there who have done it successfully but my personal thought and feeling on it is that it is potentially dangerous for our birds because if we're injecting into the keel into like the breast muscle then when we've got our bird if it's not restrained it's on a perch or on the hand and we're going in and putting a needle in if something happens even if it's nothing to do with the needle a noise a car door slams a dog barks something happens if that bird is spooked chances are it's going to go forwards off the perch into the needle if that needle breaks in your bird, you're going straight to the vets. And that is a really bad situation to be in. So for me personally, to, to do injections on birds, I prefer to teach a voluntary restraint where the bird climbs underneath a towel and lets you pick him up. And you can then hold your bird securely and safely. You can give your bird the injection without any risk to the bird at all, because the, the voluntary restraint behavior has already been trained. The bird has cooperated with that. He has the injection. You pop him back down and carry on with your training session as you were doing before. So that's that's just something which I have personal strong feelings on um, I know there are some people who are doing it protected contact they're doing it with um, a bird up against the mesh which means that the bird can't go forwards it has to back away um, so and, and that's that's definitely an option it's not something that I've done myself because I have always felt that it's better to have that bird restrained for the injection um, but that's you know if you are doing it please err on the side of caution and either use protected contact and use the mesh as a barrier or consider the voluntary restraint instead it's not honestly something we've we've thought about training. I think we would have to do, we would do it through protective contact if we were to do it. One um, other note on what you sort of talked about about um, reading behaviour and stopping it before the, the biting behaviour happens. So let's go back to the crimson example. Like Kipling is the best example. Like probably the most aggressive bird towards me in this house as a rescue, and it was through removing his opportunities to bite that our relationship started to improve. I don't think I've been bitten for it by him for a very long time. And I'm very proud of that because from what he was like to what he's like now wanting to play, it just, and again, I guess it, for me personally, it vindicates all these methods and it shows that even in the most difficult situations, they do work. It's just about being creative, using the positive reinforcement, watching, observing, basically it's just vindicating all the things that we talk about here. And if you are watching this and you're thinking, oh, well, you know, it, it's, it's not the same for me. It is. It just takes time and effort and patience i did a video on my bird i called my bird hates me because you know i wanted someone to watch it got so to come up with a dramatic title but you know it is workable through um sorry what do we have here you, i notes? i just realized that you asked me about um if i just brought a new rescue bird home and any setbacks in training and i didn't answer that so well, kind of, you kind of did in some ways because you talked <laughs> kind of about did. sort of like you know working for it, observing and yeah. you kind of did cover it so it's, if you want to add anything to it it's fine well, all I would say is that if you if you have just brought a new bird home, particularly if it's a rescue bird, then be very mindful of the fact that uh, not always, but sometimes these birds have gone through various traumas. Even if they haven't been through trauma, just the moving from one location to another can be incredibly stressful. And it, just like us, if we were suddenly uprooted and put into a whole new setting with a new set of friends and family and a new job and everything that we had to deal with, it might take us a little while to be okay. Mm -hmm. So give your bird space. 
don't rush things don't force a relationship before your bird is ready if you are just that present somebody that pops by yes i know you've got to provide food and water and clean things out but if you're doing that as unobtrusively as possible and you're not trying to force anything you're just putting deposits into your trust account here's some good things that happen when i'm here then actually it won't be very long before your bird is ready to ask for more from you and that's when you can then give more and start working on that bond and that relationship that will be so important going forward cool it's good advice it's good so i wanted to ask you specifically because obviously my experience and well sophie's uh, more broad my, my experience is basically to parrots really and a bit of invert stuff and reptiles but you have this broad experience with so many different types of animals so what i wanted to ask is is there anything um, obviously you've got the same principles across the board with positive reinforcement is there anything you think is very transferable is there anything you've sort of like picked up from training other animals that you've found very useful for training parrots specifically uh to be honest i think training multiple animals helps you with whatever species you're training because it makes you think about things more um in fact i have spent a lot of time working with birds like i said i've worked with parrots extensively i've worked with birds of prey extensively when you work with an animal that can fly away from you you really get very very good at reading behavior and observing that body language and adjusting your own body language accordingly so i would say i've learned probably more from working with birds than i I have that I now apply to all of the other animals that I work with just because you get to be better at understanding um what it is that your animal might be trying to communicate whether they're uncomfortable or whatever because if you get it wrong with a bird then it might be sitting in a tree for the next three hours and nobody really wants that it's not fun <laughs> for anyone um but I would just say that you know working like protected contact that's something that I've learned from other animals that I now apply to birds wherever possible I love protected contact now, historically, people have only used protected contact for animals that could harm us. But that's that's not being fair to protected contact, really, because I think the beauty of protected contact is that it can make our animals feel safe. Like, you know, again, we don't know what they're thinking or feeling, but the change in behavior that I see, you know, like I've done some work at some colleges recently and both of the colleges that I've been to in the last few months have had um, alpacas who are head collar trained. But by head collar trained, what they mean is once you once you corner them in the field and you put your arm around their neck, then they tolerate you putting that head collar on. And you know, some of these people are also seeing adverse behaviours where the alpacas are now starting to try and spit or kick at people when they approach them before they manage to get them into that corner because they're communicating that actually they're not very comfortable in this situation. So with both sets, we said, well, what if we work protected contact? And they looked at me like I was mad, you know, but actually, if you ask your animal to approach and put its head over the fence and you're one side of the fence and it's the other side of the fence, by the end of one session, you know, we've got alpacas putting their noses voluntarily into head collars, right? Okay, not getting it all the way on and doing it up, not in the first session, but we've taught them in one session to come over and put their nose through the noseband of the head collar in order to access treats. And that's because we're using protected contact. So the fact that, you know, that can make such a difference for domestic species, animals that people historically have just assumed that it's okay to manhandle, just because we can doesn't mean we should. That's mm -hmm. a big mantra for me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it, like historically, we've, we've got this, oh, well, they're farm animals or farmed animals. Therefore, it's OK. They're domesticated. We can do things to them. Well, you wouldn't go in and push a lion into the corner of an enclosure just to get it to put its head in something, would you? No, we use protected contact and we have great success. We can train our lions to do all sorts of different things. But that's something which I advocate for with all species, really, wherever it's possible. I look at the environment, look at the enclosure and go, do you know what? We will probably go faster with this if we work protected contact. Just did some syringe training with an African grey parrot that, you know, the, the, the trainer was actually a little bit uncomfortable going into the parrot space. Fine. That's not a problem for me at all. I'd rather you were outside anyway. So we set it up on the outside. And, you know, again, within one session, we've got the birds starting to take things from a syringe. So things can move really very quickly if we're good at observing body language and if we use that protected contact barrier. So that that's one thing that I've taken from other animals that I would now apply to parrot training. 
That's cool. I mean, protected contact is something me and Sophie really like. I mean, it's just seeing, especially if the cage is appropriate size, well furnished and the like, it shouldn't be seen as a cage. There's this very strong view that because of the word cage, that's a cage. It doesn't necessarily mean that. That's why I like the word enclosure sometimes because it takes the, the stigma out of it. But, you know, our birds like being in there, in their enclosures. They like being there. They enjoy it. And when we mm-hmm. train behaviours in there, they're happy with it because there's not a problem. And if you have a bird that's nervous and it's, say, for example, you've got a rescue home and they used to have the same uh, enclosure they used to have, they're going to be more comfortable there. So you'd want to do the training through the protective contact. It's not something you should fear and it's something you should utilise. And I think it's really important too. You gave me an idea as well for harness training potentially as well. Because I've never, I, I, this is something that's really obvious that should have occurred to me, doing harness training in the cage potentially, or, you know, just on the border of it to maybe make them feel more comfortable around it. Because we've had sort of mixed success about it. And there's a lot of people that say, um, it's again, it's like what you said, just because you can doesn't mean you shouldn't. A lot of people with baby birds will just force their head in, force their head in, and then it tolerates it. And then the harness training, we don't really want to do that here. No. So I think I'll try that through the cage in the future and see if it, we get any more dividends out of it. Yeah, um, just because, again, I'd like to echo what Nikki said about it. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. If you've got a, a, a cockatiel, for example, that always steps up and you make that assumption it's always going to step up and you start pushing your finger into it, you, you can do that, but it, you shouldn't really. You should be going back to your basics of stepping up training and giving it positive reinforcement to step up to rebuild the behavior. And that's something I encounter an awful lot in my comments where people are saying, oh, my birds just just stop stepping up. Stop. Well, why? Have you, do you reinforce it? No. Um, do you... Did, are you trying to take it back in the cage yes it's like well there you go then so you know do keep on building the behaviors if possible so this is something else i wanted to talk about as well because i've seen it a lot more on the internet recently there's there's a lot of drama in various bird groups which means so we try not to be we, we try not to get involved but we are aware of and there's a lot of people i'm not going to go into competition about having your bird free roaming the house 24 7 because that's something to put aside but a lot of people are saying recently that they don't want they don't actively want to train their bird that training is unnatural and training is no good and i my first counter argument for that well is training is natural if you have a big flock of birds in the wild they would be getting trained by their flock mates on where to find certain food sources what to do how to behave in certain situations so if those flock mates aren't available it's up to us to do that and for us to lead them to those desirable sources through target training up to us to get them to explore their environment and get the most out of it and from someone who has such extensive experience, I just wanted your opinion on it, you know, that training is for everyone. It is up to us to training. And I would argue it's also essential for us to train our parrots in the home environment. Yeah, so first of all, I absolutely agree that training our parrots in a home environment is essential, like 100% essential, especially when we're using positive reinforcement methods, scientifically based training methods. Um, So if people say, well, it's not natural to train my bird, then is it natural for your bird to live in a house? you know I mean it's something that in the zoo world you're met with quite often you know oh well these animals they should be in the wild okay well where's the wild where is safe for these animals to be and you know the actually there often isn't a suitable safe place for these animals certainly not at the, the, the numbers that we need them to be at so when you have somebody saying that it's not natural to train the animals you're right in terms of the animals would be learning from other particularly in a, a flock of birds they'd be learning from other flock mates um I would say that they are learning from you. They're changing their behavior. Maybe it's it's in the terminology. So, you know, for those people, perhaps they don't want to think about it as training. There's historically still sometimes a connotation that training means training for tricks. And actually, that's not what we're doing. We are using the science of behavior change in order to improve the welfare of the animals' lives that we're responsible for. You know, these animals, they didn't choose to be in our zoos or our enclosures or our living rooms or, you know, wherever they're living. That's where they're living because that's where we wanted them to live. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, we've already they, they didn't choose to be there. But what we are able to do is teach them how to cooperate in their own husbandry and care in order to have the best possible welfare. You know, a lot of animals live much longer under human care than they do out in the wild. There's just recently been a paper that's come out about that. Um. And if those animals are living longer, it's because they're getting medical care. They're getting access to treatment and vets. And And good food as well. Yeah, suitable nutrition, you know, without no predators. You know, there's like all of these things. But we have got a duty of care to make sure that those animals are living a life of the highest welfare that they possibly can, especially things like our parrots that live such a long time. You know, there's parrot species out there that live for 100 years. They're going to outlive all of us. So we owe it to them to make sure that 
they are not just compliant in behaviours, but actively cooperating in their own care and in the behaviours that we need from them. Remember that a lot of the behaviours that we want from our birds, they make our lives easier as well. So, you know, taking medication or stepping up and moving to a different place or having their nails trimmed, all of these things, they're things that yet yeah, might they might not need to be done in the wild because your bird might rip its nails off on a branch one day. It might get sick and not have any medication and it might not live very much longer but in the home environment it's those things make it easier for us to be able to give our birds the best quality of life so it's absolutely essential and I 100% would fight somebody who told me they didn't think they needed to <laughs> they need to train their birds you know like we train our dogs we train our cats we train you know whatever animals that we've got in our home then I don't think that our birds should be any different at all in fact in some ways they're even more important because they can fly like I said they can fly away from us if they don't like something that we're doing so we want to make them happy um Jason Dr Jason Crane had a great expression of talk about the wild especially um we can help our birds thrive rather than just survive that's and amazing. I quite like that as a very concise way of saying it. it's just we have we do have that duty. They're in they're, they're not in their natural environment. That's the way it is. You know, if you want to take a moral standpoint, rescue a bird. There's loads of birds, but any rescues out there, it is the way it is, and we can only do the best we can for them. And that's partly why me and Sophie do what we do. We want to make the world the best place we can for parrots and their owners in the situation we have. Because we're not, we're not, um, well, I, I wish I did have that sort of power to just sweep things and, you know, change things instantly, but we can't. We can just educate and try and help people through it. And training is essential, you know, getting those birds out of dangerous situations, cooperating with us. I, I Sometimes when I hear the phrase human convenience, it, it um, irritates me. But in the training context, it's a very positive, I'm not using positive, a very good thing. So I don't want to confuse what the words we're using here. It's a very good thing because, you know, it works for us, it works for them. But when I see like, for example, certain things with human convenience, like just like uh, bundling the bird back in the cage and leaving it there for all day, that is not a good example of human convenience. We like to provide substrates to the bases of our cages purely because it's it's messier, it's more annoying to clean up, but it's a heck of a lot more fun for them and it's a lot more natural for them and they really enjoy it rather than the bars, which aren't always ideal. Although it means if we try to stay away from going the full hog and saying no bars anywhere, you know, we just prefer substrates. We try to convince people to take it. Uh, yeah, um, it's an interesting one. The other, one other thing I want to mention there is trick training. Now, you talk, we talk about trick training a lot, as in like people, the people have a negative impression of uh, training in general, it's like the tricks, you know, the silly tricks. But I actually quite like the silly tricks, and not because I want to force my bird to do it for my fun, although I enjoy it. But my, uh, for, I tell you, for example, Chip, one of our smartest cockers heels, he just enjoys it so much. I trained, you know, the behavior and he just loves it. He just voluntarily offers it constantly because he actually really likes it and he enjoys the sound it makes. So, you know, trick training can be fun for people who think that it's unnatural to an extent, maybe it is, but they would do unusual things in the wild. You know, they may learn to hunt a certain insect in a, a certain tree hollow, which would involve using a tool or something. It's the same sort of uh, principle at home. So don't be scared of it. Just don't force your bird bases. What I would say on trick training, you know, if you, if they enjoy it, they want to take part in it. Why, why not? Just don't force them into it. And a lot you've kind of touched this, but just to round things off as well. I've, I've heard this expression before and I really like it. Training is science, not magic. Now, we've mentioned that this is scientifically based and a lot of people still still seem to have this impression of training and behavior, uh, modifying behavior, changing behavior, you know, working with behaviors as something that's just magical oh my goodness you're like this bird magically steps up what have you done it's not magic though as we've i, I hope this will quite this whole conversation will help you guys realize that that it is the observation it's the positive reinforcement it's the work it's the the looking at things in different perspectives from an anthropomorphic point from a non-anthropomorphic point and just approaching things from different angles yeah absolutely so i yeah it's it's it is science. Like I said at the very, very beginning that, you know, the, there are laws of behaviour change, which mean they've been tested across multiple different species in multiple different environments, whether that's in a lab setting or in the real world or, you know, it's even been observed in the wild. You know, behaviour change happens in the wild. Reinforcement, positive reinforcement exists in wild animals. You know, and that's, it's how we learn. It's how our animals learn. Um, I think there's 
uh, there's a great video somewhere of a brown capuchin trying to smash a walnut open with a rock or something. I can't remember. It's on one of the planet Earths, I think, from years and years ago. Um, but this this just really stuck in my mind because it was a perfect example of a wild animal like learning through reinforcement and like you know the science of behavior change because this animal he managed to crack open a walnut and therefore he ate his walnut reward and reinforcer and he basically then found another one carried on his behavior increased because he had been successful right and success to to our animals looks like access to reinforcers he managed to um access that reinforcer and so then he carries on he's obviously he's picked up the rope uh, the rock um smacking the walnut from watching his conspecifics you know like because animals learn by the other members in their groups as well um but then he hits and he misses the walnut and he hits his own hand and the reaction that this capuchin had he immediately dropped the walnut dropped the rock held onto his hand because obviously he just hurt himself and walked off and sat down so he then he he had been punished for trying okay so that's uh, that's how it works as well you know when we touch a hot stove we then it hurts us so we don't do it again right we now need to observe that behavior and figure out whether the punisher was strong enough that he will not ever try to crack open a walnut again with a rock or whether he'll change his antecedent arrangement and figure out a better way to hold that walnut so that he doesn't accidentally hit his hit his hand with the rock I would love to know what actually happened in like the the future after that but yeah um that sorry I I love that it's definitely something um that happens in the wild as well as you know animals are learning all of the time they are so much better at observing us than we are them that they're learning from us all the time and if I'm completely honest, I can't remember what the question was that you asked me. Oh, there we go. We're talking about science, not magic. I'm sorry. I just went off on a tangent. It's a good there. example. It's a great example. <laughs> so, yes. Um, yeah. Sometimes people do watch a training session. And if they are not well versed in reading that animal's body language, it absolutely can appear like it's magic because a trainer. Like, oh, there's a, an absolutely fantastic video on Instagram right now of Ken Ramirez. He was at... Um, he was at Steve Martin's uh, ranch, NEI, the Natural Encounters Ranch in Florida, for their um, behavior, animal behavior uh, management workshop. Um, they do them every year. They're fantastic. Um, but basically, Ken was mentoring a group of students, and one of the students said that they wanted to see Ken train. And so he stepped back. He watched this uh, blue and gold macaw. Blue and gold macaw? Might have been a blue-throated macaw. Watched this macaw for a couple of minutes and then decided he was going to try and teach him to spin. And if you watched just that video alone, the application of the science that Ken uses looks like magic because he is so skilled in reading the animal, observing body language and timing and reinforcing the behavior that he wants to see. He gets this bird doing the spin in, you know, less than a minute. And it's absolutely phenomenal to watch. Go and look it up. You'll find it on uh, Ken's Instagram if you're interested. Um, but it isn't magic. It is the fact that Ken has spent 40 years learning and applying the science of behavior change with so many different species. And that's the key. Get really good at observing, get really good at knowing your animal. For you guys at home who've got your pet birds, you've only got one bird or two, maybe three birds that you're looking at, right? So get really, really good at knowing what each of those birds is going to do based on their behaviors. When you're really good at that and you understand how important timing is when you're delivering your reinforcers, you can shape behavior like the best of them out there you know is it's just the application of science through years of practice and experience and you know having that that skill and the accessibility you know being able to practice the skill with different animals as well but it's definitely not magic I'm sad to say it would be great if it was because you know then we'd be we'd be magicians and famous but <laughs> Target stick but the magic definitely... wand, you know, waving a target stick <laughs> Absolutely. around. Absolutely, yeah. When working in a zoo environment, I used to have people say, "Oh, but how did you get them to do that?" And I'm like, "Well, I've I've trained them to do that." You mean that, like, but do they do it the same every day? Well, no, because they're birds and they're individuals and they're not remote controlled and they're flying and sometimes they fly differently because of the wind conditions or the weather or where I stood when I cued the behavior to happen. The behavior is fly. It's not, you know fly straight line exactly from here, like, here yeah absolutely <laughs> so yeah but that's yeah definitely it's uh 
all in the science, all in the details. So remember, when you when you watch this stuff, watch um, Nikki's content on Instagram. I'll leave some links in the description of Nikki's social if you want to explore more of Nikki's content. If you watch our channels, anyone's channels, you know, don't think it's magic. It's science. You can apply it at home. It just takes observation, as Nikki just said. And it just takes um, a bit of persistence and um What's the other word? I like consistency being another good word to use on it. Just keep trying. And you can always drop comments on me and Sophie will always try and reply and help you. But I think that gives us a good point to round things off on. I'm very grateful for Nikki for taking the time to come on and talk to me about these topics. It's, I'm very appreciative of you popping on and taking time out of your schedule to do so. If any of you guys do want to talk to Nikki, just drop a, a message on socials if you need her help maybe or want to hire a business skills because she is very talented or maybe next time you have a course because uh, you do do courses regularly and maybe they'll pop up as well but in the meantime from me and nikki i'd like to wish you all a good day and hope you all have really lots of success with your training so take care and see you later bye everyone <laughs>